Hi, Nick Coles from Data Trek here. And the topic of today's video is the first thing that I look at whenever I'm assessing a stock or equity index. We'll cover three things in today's video. The first is I'll start with my mental model about how stock markets actually value equities over the longer run. Then I'm going to give you eight examples of both good and bad names over time and discuss why they ended up being great or in some cases just simply lousy investments. And then I'll wrap up with my reasons for why the one simple hack I'm going to show you today can help you avoid long-term term losers and give you a decent shot at finding some great stocks that will work for you over the long run. Let's start with a discussion of why do stocks even work over three, five, ten year stretches? Why do some stocks double and some stocks just sit flat or even decline? And I think three factors make for a winning public market stock, a winning public company. The first is pretty straightforward. Their earnings are greater than their cost of capital. The second is they'll grow their business even while their returns on capital are better than their cost of capital. And then thirdly, they can maintain or expand their competitive position. Now that's a lot of terms in a very short period of time. Let me give you a simple example about how this works. Say you fund a new company with a million dollars a year. That's because you expect it to earn at least $100,000 a year over the long run. Now, why is that? You could have just taken that million dollars and put it into the S&P. That'd make you roughly 10%. So why would you fund a new company with even greater risk than the S&P if you weren't expecting to make at least $100,000 a year in that business? That would make it worth a million dollars. Now, let's say that company does really well and it starts to earn $200,000 a year and can think you can do that for quite a long period of time. Well, congratulations. That investment's now worth at least $2 million because if you take $200,000 and discount it by 0.1 or 10%, you get $2 million. Now, how did the company go from $100,000 to $200,000 in earnings? Most likely, it improved its earnings because it grew its business by reinvesting the money that it was making into more capital, maybe hiring more people or buying more machinery, and its competitive advantage, whatever makes it special, allowed it to continue to earn a very good return on capital on all that incremental investment. That's how a stock works over time. There's three paradigms I want to share with you that I think are important for this discussion on top of what I've just explained in terms of how stock markets actually value investments. And these are things that I think many of you have probably seen, but I wanted to just put them in front of you again for a quick review. The first one is called the DuPont model. It's been around for over 100 years. It was literally invented at the old DuPont chemical company. And it's a simple way of analyzing and measuring return on capital, return on equity. And basically, it breaks down return on capital into two components. One is profit margins, how much does a company make for every dollar of revenues, and then asset efficiency or asset intensity, how many dollars of capital does it take to create the dollar of revenues. Let me give you a simple example to kind of explain how different this model can be for different kinds of companies. Say you have a grocery store. <clears throat> it will not make a whole lot of money on every piece of food it sells, but it's going to turn over its inv inventory base very quickly. It's going to sell the entire store's inventory every week or two or three. So it might not make much money, but it has very high asset efficiency. Now compare that to say a high-end jewelry store. It might stock a, a diamond ring or a sapphire necklace for a year or two before it actually sells because it's very expensive. But they're going to make a lot of money on that sale. So that's a very high margin, very high asset intensive business. And as a result, those two businesses might be actually about the same when it comes to return on capital. But they go about making their money in very different ways. The second paradigm to think about is what's called Michael Porter's Five Forces Analysis. This, is, this has been around since even before I went to business school. And what it does is explain that a business or an industry's profitability over time is driven by a combination of forces. The first set of forces are the relative power of suppliers and customers. So how much more power your suppliers have over you might diminish your margins. Same goes for customers. If your customers have more power over you, then your margins tend to decline. And the other axis is the threat of new entrants and substitutes. So how likely is it that a new company will come in and try to take some of your business away? And then how likely is it that there are substitutes for whatever it is you offer that might push your margins up or down? So that's another way to think about profit margins and return on capital in a more of an industrial framework. And the last one is Clayton Christensen's disruptive innovation paradigm. This is a relatively newer idea in business, but I think probably the most powerful one over the last 30 years. 
And what it says is that a company is called disruptive if it enters a market at the low end. So for example, Amazon was selling books when it started. And it uses a new technology, like in the case of Amazon, the internet, to serve that low end market more efficiently or better than existing competition. That's exactly what Amazon did. But the important thing is that over time, they go up the food chain, the company, the disruptive company, adds new products and services to make their product more compelling. And consumers, because they kind of like the original product, just continue to buy more from the company over time. And again, this is the Amazon story to a T. Now, the important thing about these three concepts is first, they inform stock valuations. And secondly, they are very visible in all the long run price charts that you'll ever look at for a company. And that is my hack. I always start with looking at the long term price chart of a company because it tells me how the market has interpreted these three forces, these three paradigms, all of which collectively drive the value of the stock. So let's dig into some examples because it's pretty compelling once you see the pictures. This is Ford. Now the Ford Motor Company currently trades for roughly $11 a share. It was at $11 a share in 1987. It saw its peak in 1998, and it's been kind of stagnant ever since. Now look, this is better than GM, which went bankrupt during the financial crisis, or Chrysler, which was roughly the same. Ford has survived. It's not a bad company, but it lives in a very, very bad industry because the auto industry has global overcapacity and a lot of new entrants not to mention now the issue of electric vehicles. So when you look at Ford, very fine company, but a very difficult place to make money, either as an investor or as a company, which is why the stock is the same as it was in the 1980s. It's had some corporate actions over the years that have helped a little bit, but this chart fundamentally shows that if you own Ford today, you're betting on a big change in the global auto industry. Perhaps a lot of bankruptcies where Ford can take share, or you're hoping that Perhaps there are some tariffs that are then support the U.S. auto industry and allow this company to make more money over time. But if you own Ford, you're betting on a big change in the industry. I personally think that's kind of a tough bet, but I understand why people make it. So that's Ford. Good company, bad industry. Lots of pressure on margins, lots of pressure on return on capital. Very visible in the chart. Now here's Intel, which was just in the news last week for potentially being uh, a buyout candidate or a purchase candidate. It's the same price right now as 1997. <clears throat> and this is for a whole host of reasons. You can see the spike to the top in 2000 during the dot-com bubble, and it has never seen that price since. It has been stagnant for the better part of 20 odd years. Again, it's Miss Mobile Computing. It is a very capital intensive business, and now it's challenged by AI. So if you own Intel, again, you're hoping for something to change because the long term story for the company based on this chart says it's had a lot of challenges and it's been very difficult to make money in the stock aside from as a trade. It's not been a good long term winner. So even though it's a tech company, it has not done well. The next chart to look at is Sony. You know, Sony was a great brand name in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, very innovative company. But its all-time high was in 1999, and the stock now trades for the same price as 1999. This company went from being hugely innovative to basically being a follower in technology. And that kind of sums up why this chart looks the way it does. It has not been able to grow its capital with good margins and good efficiency and better returns on capital in order to be a value creating company. It has failed that basic challenge and that's why the stock trades where it does roughly the same as 1999. Now it's not just companies that you can use this tool for. I also use it when I look at ever a long run stock index of say, in this case, emerging markets. This chart shows you MSCI emerging markets, the EEM, back to uh, 2004, and you'll see that the price today, roughly $44 a share, is the same as 2007, so before the financial crisis. This index, which covers basically every emerging market around the world, has not gone anywhere since before the financial crisis. It's had some good moves. It hit a peak in 2021, but it's been flat since 2007. So this tells you that as a whole, emerging markets, while they grow GDP, no doubt about that, stock markets don't value GDP. They value earnings and they value competitive advantage and they value return on capital. 
all the things we've discussed. And this tells you that in the market's view, these companies have real challenges. The companies in emerging markets have real challenges in generating high returns on capital for a long period of time and showing competitive advantage. So the bottom line here is, as I put it the, in the chart, stocks discount earnings, not GDP. So think about that whenever you're looking at an emerging market or non-US equity investment. Now let's start talking about some winners because there are certainly a lot of them. Here's Walmart. Walmart has perhaps did have a difficult period in the 2000s, but since 2012, it's up over 200%. Why is that? Well, I think we all know the Walmart story. It's a low-end retail category killer with very strong store economics. It makes a return on capital on its stores well in excess of the cost of capital because it has competitive advantage in sourcing and store format and training and um, IT and so many things that that's what allows this stock to do well. It's been a long-term winner. Or, for example, let's look at J.P. Morgan. This one's an interesting one to me because, let's face it, banking is kind of a commodity business. Every bank has money to lend or to uh, utilize in capital markets. J.P. Morgan has one kind of interesting and unique advantage. Jamie Dimon's been the CEO since 2006. And as you can see, the stock kind of hung around um, through the 1990s and into the 2000s. But when he became CEO... After the financial crisis especially, this stock began to work really well. And it's one way of remembering that as much as, as an analyst, I like to look at things very uh, cut and dried and based on the numbers, people do matter. And in my perspective, Jamie Dimon's tenure at J.P. Morgan shows that's the case. He has guided that ship to focus on high returns on capital, maximizing returns over cost of capital, and growing the business intelligently over time. And that's why this chart looks the way it does. Next up is a sector, small, uh, large cap technology, the XLKs, uh, which, by the way, I own personally. And this is a very interesting case study in the fact that capital markets can overestimate technology value over time. So, for example, from 1999 to 2013, the XLK made no money. It had a big run into 2000. It obviously fell apart, and it took a long time to claw that back. However, from 2014 to 2024, the last 11 years, it's up 500%. Innovative disruption, disruption always wins at the end of the day. You have to be careful where you buy it because the late 1990s tell us that the market can get overly enthusiastic about the competitive advantage or the return on capital of tech companies. But I think tech companies now are much better in terms of return on capital and expanding their capital base intelligently and growing their business than they were in the late 1990s when it was a bunch of unprofitable smaller companies for the most part. So we're in a better position now but this chart's meant to show that the market does reward competitive advantage, disruptive innovation, high returns on capital, and the ability to reinvest that capital for further growth. So this is really, in many ways, a case study in how this whole process works. Um, as a last data point, I just wanted to, to show you that even shorter-term time frames can tell you a real story about how the market's looking at return on capital and cost of capital and how competitive companies are in generating good returns in their businesses for shareholders. And what this uh, table shows you is the 10-year compounded annual growth rate, total return, so including dividends, for U.S. companies, S&P 500, Russell, versus rest of the world. And what you'll see is that over the last 10 years through the end of August, the S&P 500 has compounded at 12.9%, the Russell at 8%. But the minute you go offshore, the returns are much lower. So MSCI EFA, 5.2% over the last 10 years. Europe, a little better, 5.5. Japan, a little better still, 6.0. And then emerging markets, just 1.8. What this tells me is that the market, the global equity market, understands that U.S. companies are fundamentally better at creating strong return on capital businesses that can generate good returns for a long period of time in excess of their cost of capital and reinvest those cash flows intelligently to grow the businesses further. This is the market's way of saying that the U.S. system of capitalism has done a better job in those challenges. Now, this is not to say it can go on forever. I do think it is the case, but one could argue that if there were a major change in how Europe or emerging markets or Japan dealt with things like competitive advantage with new technologies, 
we're investing more in venture capital or in research universities that can generate new ideas, that those industries in those geographies could pull equity market returns for those areas up. However, I see very little sign of that right now. But if that's your perspective, absolutely, the returns for non-U.S. stocks can get better. But for the last 10 years, we know the, the story. It's bred here. The market has said the U.S. equities, U.S. economy does the better job of that. So, summing up a couple of takeaways. The long-run historical price data that we've shown you here clearly tells us how successful companies and sectors in geographic regions have been at generating sustainable returns over time. It's very clear when a company or a sector or even a whole country can do a good job with that because the market rewards it and when they really struggle, in which case the market punishes them. Now, markets can be wrong, obviously, for even a couple of years, but I think they seldom make mistakes over longer time frames. So the charts I've shown you, it's really important to look at long run charts. It isn't just a matter of a one or three or five year chart. You want to understand how a company has traded over a decade, over a cycle, and if it's been considered a value creator or not. It's a big difference. If you're looking at a stock that's been flat for a bunch of years, the most important question to ask is what's going to fundamentally change about that company or that sector that makes returns better and more stable and stronger over time? If a stock's been doing well or a sector's been doing well or a geography, then the question to ask is, why is that going to continue? What are the fundamental issues that the market rewarded and can that continue over the future? Again, very different questions, but really, I think, anchored on the idea that look at that long-term chart. Now, the bottom line about why all this works is that I think the only thing that really moves asset prices higher or lower over the short or long run is surprise, for good or for bad. And the price charts tells you how dramatic a surprise that has to be to make a stock work. In some cases, not a lot of surprise required, U.S. big tech, for example. In other cases, like Ford or like Sony or some of the names I showed you at the beginning of the conversation, the issue is going to be much more severe. The questions you're going to have to ask are much more harsh. How can this industry go from being a value destroyer to a value creator? Again, all of this is possible, but these are the right questions to ask. So with that, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit like and subscribe and look forward to talking to you again soon. Have a great day.